right. Who's ready for the word of God? We sang some songs of worship. We prayed. We need to hear from God. We do know what book we're in, right? We're in the same book. I'm not jumping around. You, you realize that? Everybody's tracking, right? We're going to be in Acts chapter 6. six. Um, I've been loved studying the book of Acts this, these past few weeks. Uh, pastors have the greatest job in the world, by the way. I get to study the Word of God and pray and spend time with God and say, God, help, help our people. Help your people at the church. Uh, it's the greatest job ever. Um, but it's really been good for me, especially to be reminded of the necessity and the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian and the life of the church. Folks from Manuel, I think you, you can agree, you would agree, there's a need. We have a need for the Holy Spirit. We, have, we need His power. We need His presence in our lives. Amen. Right? In Damascus, uh, we, when we started, I hope I've been very clear, though, like 75% of our people are gone today. Am I muted on the channel? Or no? I don't know what's going on here. Check, check. Can you guys not hear me out there? Hello. Check, check. Hey. Just Sorry about this. Back here. Can you hear me Hello? There you go. What if I uh, just speak really loud and put this near me? We can adjust on the fly. Look at that. <laughs> Okay, uh, Damascus Church, like I said, a lot of people are out, and so, but uh, what I was going to say is I hope I've been very clear as we've set out to go and plant a church in Midland and reach people for, for Christ, the people of Midland, I hope that we know that nothing will happen apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, Amen. right? Um, we can come up with as many programs, with as many strategies. We can memorize all this and that. We can know the gospel ins and out. We can speak to people till we're blue in the face. But unless the power of the Holy Spirit is working in us and through us and in, in the lives of those we're trying to reach, it will come to nothing. And, and so we know the parable. You guys probably remember the parable that Jesus spoke about the seeds that were being sown. Jesus said that the seed is going to be sown, which is the word of God. And the soils represent the heart, the, each person's heart who hears, and it can either be snatched away right away, it can be scorched out for lack of roots, or it, it can be choked out by the worries and cares of this life, or last, it lands on good soil, a receptive heart, and it grows, and it matures, and it bears much, much fruit. It's only this last one sown in good soil that produces fruit, right? This is the case of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of believers, right? Giving the word, but also Holy Spirit is working in the lives of those who receive the word. And so uh, I've just been loving the book of Acts. It's it's so exciting. I think it's, probably said this before, I think it's my new favorite book of the Bible because it's, it's the church age. And we're still in the church age. What the apostles were doing is the same thing God calls his church to do today which is to trust Jesus, to follow Jesus, proclaim the name of Jesus, and help others follow Jesus. If you're familiar, familiar with Acts, um, or you've been following closely, you, you may have noticed there seems to be this pattern in the early church that they faced. The first thing we kind of see is this external conflict. They faced those who were trying to stop the power of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, um, stop the kingdom from advancing, but then quickly we see there's internal conflict that happens. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? Um, and then after that, once again, external conflict. Those who try to stop the name of Jesus and the gospel from being promoted, as we saw last week, the high priests and the Jewish religious leaders who were trying to prevent the apostles from ever speaking in the name of Jesus. But of course they said, well, judge for yourselves. Uh, in the sight of, is it right in the sight of God to obey you or him? And, and they said, we must obey God. We've already told you this. So we're going to keep proclaiming the gospel. And then Gamaliel, he offered sound advice when he said, if something is of human origin of, or of human will, it's going to die off. But if this teaching and this movement is from God, it cannot be stopped. You will find yourself fighting against God. And that's who they found themselves fighting against. And, and uh, when angels start to intervene, when God gives you the words in the moment by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel, 
And when you're able to suffer supernaturally for the cause of Christ and even rejoice in it, count it a privilege that you would be counted worthy to suffer. When all these things are happening, truly you're fighting against God. Because it's only the Holy Spirit who can produce this in his people and in the church. And so these Jewish religious leaders, they found themselves fighting against God, cannot be stopped. Even to this day, the work of Christ and his kingdom advancing cannot be stopped. And so that was just another source of external conflict. But guess what's going to happen next? External conflict, internal conflict. External conflict, internal conflict. We're going to see once, once again today because... Because we know this about church people, right, is um, no one ever complains. We, we don't complain in the church, uh, uh, at least not in this church, right? No one has ever complained about anything. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just joking, and you're going to find that out today. I'm sure there's a church in Revelation where it says, uh, you know, the letters to the churches, that, that they grumbled, they complained, and they did very little to advance the kingdom of God. Let's hope that's not our church. But the title of my message today is, Are You Hindering God's Mission? What's the mission? You know, what, what, First, what is God's mission? What is his plan and purpose for the church and for Christians like us? Well, I'm going to give two main passages you should know by now. First is Jesus gave the disciples after his resurrection. The, it's called the Great Commission. It says, Go and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you even to the end of the age. And then a reiteration of this in Acts chapter 1. He says, but you're going to receive my power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, to all the ends of the earth. This is God's mission and purpose for the church, right? So we are to be his witnesses. We are to share the gospel. We call people to repent and believe as well as well as what the church does, we baptize. We train people to walk in the ways of Jesus. That's called disciple making, which just means learning the ways of Jesus. We are imitating Christ, our maker. And God's mission is that every tribe, tongue, and nation will hear of Christ, and he will save people from every group, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And uh, a very exciting passage comes from Matthew 24, 14, when people were asking, well, when's the end of the world going to happen? When is Jesus going to come back? And you know what he says? He says, when that very last person from whatever tribe, tongue, or nation that is, that they will hear the gospel and they believe, and then the end will come. So we're just waiting. We're waiting for that to happen. Lord, pray that it will happen soon, right? So we, we know the mission isn't over yet. The end didn't come, which means God still has those people so let's join the mission of God, and if we're going to do so, we must be careful not to hinder or neglect the mission of God. There are actions in the church among Christians that we do that I believe hinder the advancement of the kingdom, of more or more disciples being made. And uh, I'm sorry to do this, but uh, I'm going to start off, I'm going to address some negative ways that we hinder the mission. These are negative points, but, but I'm going to give you a practical, positive way that we can join the mission of God, that we can fuel the mission of God to see his kingdom advance in all the world. Anybody want that? Who's with me? I want that. So the book of Acts is very intense. It's like scene after scene, act after act, the Holy Spirit is working, and there's spiritual battle going on, right? It's very, very clear. It's more than a physical world that we live in. There's a spiritual battle, and so the church of Jesus Christ, they're facing enemies on the outside, those external battles, but it swings to the internal as well. As we jump into Acts chapter 6, Starts off really good, but here's what it says. In those days when the disciples were increasing in number, it's a good thing, the Grecian, or the Hellenist Jews, it might say in your Bible, among them began to grumble against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Um, so two things to remember. Remember in the day of Pentecost, all those Jews from all the other nations came to the temple and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the apostles, and they began speaking languages, these foreign languages for these other Jews, So, such as the Greeks and the Hellenistic Jews. So they kind of hung around after that powerful movement, and they joined the church. They're believers, but they're, they're kind of different from the Hebraic Jews. They're, they're unique compared to them. These Hellenistic Jews, for one, they had their own translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. It was in Greek. And, they, of course, the, the Hebrew Jews, they had their Hebrew, and, and their worship was very much tied to the temple, temple practices. Everything was 
surrounded and, and had involved the temple, but um, not these Hellenist Jews. They, they were not familiar with that. They didn't really utilize the temple in their worship. And so it was easy for them to be overlooked and, and perhaps uh, just seen as different, like a subclass of this Hebrew Jews, right? But then, but then um, what, but remember what happened in the early church. What, what come, they come together, and there's this powerful community where it says they're devoted to the word of God. They're devoted to one another. They're devoted to the fellowship and the breaking of bread. And there was no one among them that had a need. This is a powerful thing. So here are the, all these Jews from all parts of, of the world and, and the region are, ex, are experiencing this or should be experiencing this. They would sell things to make sure every need was met, and, and then we have the exact same thing going on right here in this text. Apparently, there was a daily distribution that was given out, um, and especially and in particular to widows who were very vulnerable in that time. This, there was no provision for widows in the scripture. It's kind of like if someone else is going to step up and, and take care of them, if not, they're going to be left to their own. They might as well live in the streets, so the church... Rightly so, they step up and they take care of the widows. And so there's this distribution of food that was happening every day. And these Hellenistic Jews, these Greek Jews, they began to grumble against the Hebraic Jews because they're like, hey, how come our widows, these, these Greek widows, they're not getting the food when you guys do, or they're not getting the right amount of food, or you're getting the good stuff, you're getting the pizza or whatever, and we're just getting the crumbs. So they were grumbling and they were complaining. Humans are really bad at complaining. Isn't that true? It's like, it's, actually, that might be one of the greatest gifts of humans is that we're, we, we grumble and we complain. And Christians, we're not exempt from that, right? Um, sometimes I think it's Christians and people in the church that are highly skilled in complaining. But that's, that's not you guys. That's not Damascus on Amanda. We would never do that. And uh, that's just all the other churches out there, the other Christians. <laughs> I remember uh, seeing a video clip of this YouTuber. I think he's like a prankster. And he would call the Craigslist ads, you know, like the freebies, the giveaways. And, uh, and he would ask them to give them even more stuff than what they were offering. So he, like, calls them up. He's like, hey, I heard you have that, that couch in the love seat on Craigslist. You, you know, yeah, I got it. It's ready. It's, it's free. You can come and get it. He's like, well, what kind of shape is it in? Oh, it's, it's all right. I've, I've had dogs, so they scratched them up a little bit. And he's like, okay, well, hmm. You got like a coffee table to go with it or something? And he's like, no, I, I don't. No, I just don't have an extra coffee table to go with it. But the couch and the love seat is free for you to have and just come and pick it up. And he's like, oh, well, what good is the couch and a love seat if I don't have a coffee table? You know, I, I need the whole set. And so needs and complaints can hinder God's mission. And, and so we can have bad reasons for complaining in the church. Just like, just like this guy who calls on Craigslist, this freebies, and he, and he wants even more. And I think what it is, is when our reasons for complaining come out of unnecessary wants or even just desires. Hey, you know, this would be nice, or this is my personal preference or opinion. I think that's the bulk of church complaints that even come from Christians. We grumble and we complain about things going on in the church. Not because... Not because it's that God's not meeting our needs in and through the church. It's because, well, we don't like the preacher. We, we don't like the pastor. We don't like the Bible translation. We don't like the, what people are wearing. We don't like the music. We don't like the way the church looks. And so on. Right? So, so these are all, I would say, bad reasons to complain. Which, which really tears down the church. And it's rooted in selfishness. It's not rooted in the spirit. These clearly are things that have to do with being led of our own flesh and, and of our own pride. Now, we know better where we begin to judge others, we criticize others, and we move away from what's most important. This is the kind of complaint that tears down and divides a church, making it unfruitful and unproductive for the kingdom of God, like, like a bowl of standing stale water just sitting there. It's not a source of flowing, vibrant waters as it should be. And, and, and But... But here's the thing, needs and complaints can hinder God's mission, but then meeting, meeting legitimate needs fuels God's mission. Meeting legitimate needs fuels God's mission. So we can have reasons for complaining about the church, like I said, this guy who calls Craigslist, but, um, sorry, uh, here we are, I lost my spot. Um, what we see here in the text is that 
the church is blowing up in Acts, right? It's exploding. More and more people are being added. It says hundreds, even thousands of people are being added to the church. And so far, it's the apostles, these, these few men, these 12 guys, they're the main leaders. They're trying to love and care for the church and shepherd them and meet their needs and go to prayer and go and preach and teach God. And they're doing everything. And so the Spirit is, um, so what we see here is, is a legitimate complaint, right? A legitimate need, which comes from these widows being overlooked from the daily distribution of food. The church, I would contend, should certainly be stepping up and meeting those legitimate needs. And when we do, it truly is the power of the work of the Spirit. It's no longer our flesh, as we see in this. And this is a beautiful picture in Acts chapter 2, where it says, no one, no one has a need. The same thing is going on here. <clears throat> this need arises in the widows, and, and, and occurring. Uh, this is occurring in the church. It, it's a legitimate need. And um, I, I would say, even today within the church, we should be doing all we can to meet legitimate needs. Now, remember, this, those are not the same as wants. They're not the same as desires. They're not the same as personal opinions or preferences. That's, that's not what God wants you to bring to the church. A legitimate need is someone saying, hey, I've done all I can. I've, I've tried this. I've tried that. It's not happening. Can, can the church help me with this? Can the church step up and help? And I think when we do a meal train, that's an example of a legitimate need. Someone just has a surgery. They're not able to get up. They're not really moving around that well. They, they need to just chill out. And they have a family to feed. So the church should step up and set up a meal train. We can do that, and we have done that. And I want to commend all of you for, even recently, your participation in that. That is a beautiful picture of the church stepping up to meet legitimate needs. And, uh, and I think that's a great example, right? Uh, or someone loses their job, and they're trying really hard. They're... Applying to all these places, they get rejected, none of these interviews are working out for them, and, and then their mortgage payment is due. Or they're about to lose their house, and the church is going to help in that time to ensure that that person always has a roof over their head. To me, that's legitimate. Those are legitimate needs being met within the church. So there are good complaints. These are not bad things. When, and what we can conclude from this, though, is that needs and complaints can hinder God's mission but when we meet legitimate needs out of love and care as a church, it feels God's mission. But it can become a problem still, even legitimate needs, when complaints, meeting needs, when, it, when does it become problematic or not pleasing to God? And we see this um, in verses 2 through 4. So the twelve summoned all the disciples and said, It is unacceptable for us to neglect the word of God in order to weigh down tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men, confirmed to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will appoint this responsibility to them. And, and we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So neglecting prayer and the Word of God can hinder God's mission. This church has gotten really big, the apostles can't do everything, and they know that it would be wrong. It would be unacceptable for them to continue in their ways, trying to address all these matters and meet all these needs within the church, because it would lead to a neglect of prayer and the Word of God. Remember, what, what did Jesus tell the disciples to do? What, what did he say their mission was to be? He says, go and proclaim the gospel, preach the Word, make disciples. It's foundation to the mission of God. This very foundation is, is the cornerstone. The mission of God is prayer and the word of God. It's this message being sent out. And there's nothing more important than this. It, it would be wrong. It would be sinful to neglect this for ministries within the church. Just meeting these needs. Why? Because there wouldn't even be a church without this. You thought about that? There wouldn't be a people. There wouldn't be this thing called the church if there wasn't first prayer and the word of God. In prayer and preaching the words of Jesus Christ, there's nothing more important. There's nothing more foundational. You can't, you can't neglect that and then go tend to all these matters in the church. There are legitimate needs, and this is right for the church to speak up and protect these widows. It's a right thing. There's nothing in the text that suggests that it's wrong or there's a negative complaint that this, this shouldn't be addressed. It, it was, and rightly so, but not at the expense. Not at the way of instead of getting in the way of or neglecting prayer in the ministry of the Word of God. This is one ministry in the church that 
can never end. It can never end. It must continue. That's why churches will sometimes do 24 hours of prayer. You may have seen this. Some of them may even do 24-7, where everyone has maybe like a 30-minute time slot, and we're going to sign up and round the clock. We're going to be in prayer. So your time comes. Hopefully you're seeking the Lord in prayer. Jesus said, apart from him, we can do nothing. Right? Apart from him, by praying and asking the Holy Spirit to speak boldness, proclaim his word, then this will come to nothing. And these things is what caused the church to advance in the first place. That's why, that's what adds people to the church. Even these widows, they're added to the church first because of prayer and the ministry of the word. You see, you see what I'm trying to get at here? This is foundational. This is the foundation of God's mission and his purpose. There's nothing more important. And if you neglect this, you fail to be a church. Which is why there's many churches across Midland, across the, the state, across the U.S., even the world, that call themselves a church, but they're really not. You know why? Because they're not praying, and, and they're not really preaching and teaching the faithful word of God. And it could seem like, oh, well, you know, I, I think that, isn't that, that's what a church is supposed to do. They're supposed to do good things and, and practical, meet practical needs, yeah? We can and we do. That's, that's part of loving the community and the, and the unity that we care for one another. But guess what? If, if there isn't prayer in the Word of God, then, then we're just a, a social club, right? We're just, we're just another charitable institution. And there are many out there. You, you can, there's plenty across Midland. If you just need food, if you just need clothing, if you need shelter, there's other agencies that can help you with that. But what they can't help you with is the message the good news that everlasting life is only in Christ. It's only in prayer. It's through the word of God. To neglect these is to bring death upon the world. It's, it's to wish death upon every soul in the world. There's no greater good than prayer and the word of God. There's no greater consequence if we neglect that. So we must, prioritizing, but by prioritizing prayer and the word of God, it fuels God's mission. The apostles recognized this, this crisis it would have been, if, and, and the foolishness if they were going to be disobedient to the Lord, if they didn't continue in prayer and not devote themselves to, to preaching. This would be on par with disobedience. So when this happens, they need wisdom. They need to make a choice. They need help, right? Because, by the way, they, they can't do this all. That'd be like me in this church and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be like Jerry, I'm going to greet you at the door, and then I'd be like Donna, I'm going to give you the bulletin, and I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to be like Kit, and I'm going to sing the songs, and I'm going to do a prayer, and I'm going to lead the drums, and I'm going to decorate the church and do hospitality, and I'm going to cook, and I'm going to clean, and I'm going to do everything. That would be a disaster if that was all up to me. It wouldn't be very fun. You guys would not be very blessed if you put me in charge of all of that, because I don't think it's my skill and my gift either. Not all of those things, right? I couldn't do all that, and you wouldn't want me to. Everything would be lousy. But so something needs to happen. Someone else needs to step up. The church and its leaders need to do something to meet legitimate needs so that the mission of God can continue. And they do. They recommend and select seven men confirmed to be full of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so again, the Holy Spirit should be evident. We're looking for leaders, true, faithful, trusted people of integrity who truly have the Spirit who are living by the Spirit. Not like Ananias and Sapphira. We don't need liars who are trying to step up and lead and help the church. We don't want those type of leaders. We want people who have integrity, who are faithful, who have wisdom, and they have serious skill. There's, there's a lot of people. We're talking in this church, thousands of people. There's lots of widows. There's lots of food. This, this, the ministry program is just growing. The ministry of practical and physical needs, it's way beyond what the apostles were going to do and what they were called to do. And so it says, we will appoint those to be responsible for them, and we will devote ourselves to the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. And this was the proposal, and it says, it pleased the whole group. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, the Holy Spirit, as well as Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented the seven to the apostles who prayed, on, who prayed for them and laid hands on them. And so that needs to happen. That, that's what needed to happen here is that the church needed to step up. And, and they heed to this call, and thankfully that's exactly what they do because not stepping up and not serving can hinder God's mission. Um, 
So what we see here is that if you don't step up, if you don't serve, it can hinder God's mission, and that's exactly what would have been the case if the church didn't recognize this, if they didn't choose these men to step up, these men with wonderful names, Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, love Bible names, right? Uh, what's very interesting about this, and I think it's intentional, is that all these names here are, are Greek. They're Hellenistic names, which, which means the widows, uh, they thought it, the apostles thought it wise to, to, to put Greeks or Hellenistic people in charge of these Greek widows who were being overlooked. Um, just, for, just for the sake of honesty and transparency and integrity, right? It's, it's like they're not the only ones that can do stuff in the church, and that's always needed in ministry. But there's some important characters in that list uh, that we're going to get into later in the book of Acts, including the man named Stephen. He becomes the first martyr in, in the Christian faith. He's a man full of faith. He, he lays down his life and... and um, Eventually, you know, leads to his death for faithfully following and proclaiming Jesus. But then there's Philip. He has a cool little story we're also going to pick up later in the book of Acts. But, but as far as these other guys, Prochorus and, and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, I don't know much more about them. The, uh, the scriptures, I don't believe, talks about them anymore. But, hey, at least they made scripture. Their names are in, in the book of life. My name, is, my name isn't in the Bible. Hopefully it's in the book of life, by the way. You see that in Revelation. But, um they present these men, though, to the seven apostles who then pray over them and they lay hands on these men. Why do they do this? Well, God has called the apostles to a unique role. And what they do here is they're, this praying, on, praying over them, this laying on the hands is associated with many things. One, it can be associated with, with healing people. Sometimes the apostles did that. Jesus laid his hands on people and they were healed. Uh, sometimes people uh, laid hands on others to bestow a spiritual gift. That's what Paul does with young Timothy. But in this particular case, this laying on of hands has to do with a calling. That God is calling these people, these individuals, they're being set apart for service, being set apart for this ministry. This is, this is like a commissioning type of thing happening here. This laying on of hands is to show the affirmation, to show the support the, and the identity of the apostles and of the church, that what these men we agree, we affirm, we believe the Holy Spirit is calling these men to this task. And so they lay hands on them and pray for them. About a year and a half ago, we were, we were in the process of planning, planning and preparing to plant Damascus Church. And we were part of Sunrise up the road. We were attending there. Uh, There's lots of things we had to do. It's just a buzz of a time. It's everything we had to get ready to do leading up to our launch date of October 16th. And the Sunday before we were in attendance with Sunrise, they basically kind of had a service for us where, where um, they talked about church planning and ministry, what God's calling was, stuff like that. But at the end of it, they had our whole core team come up to the front, and the whole church was asked to come around us. And the elders, the pastors, they were, they were there. They were praying for us, and they laid hands on us because they believed, and they were affirming, they were supporting our call to go and plant a church for the gospel. They were, um, they were identifying with us as brothers and sisters for, uh, in Christ who were being sent out like missionaries in their midst. So they were trying to be, as, be faithful to the scripture, just like in the text. They were setting us apart for the work of ministry and the service which God called us. Because if we're not stepping up and if, if we don't step up and serve, we can hinder God's mission. So instead, we should selflessly serve to fuel God's mission. If Stephen and Philip and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and, and these others, they don't step up and serve, the church could have imploded. But they selflessly step up to meet those legitimate needs so the apostles can continue to do what they were called to do, which is devotion to prayer and, and the gospel of Jesus. And when all this happens, you think of like a car, a machine, and all the gears are turning at the, at the right time and in the right place. Some amazing things begin to happen. When the church does this, you see this in verse 7. So the word of God continued to spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem grew rapidly, and a great number of priests became obedient to the faith. That's what we want, right? That's what we're hoping for. Amen. Hey, this, is a good, this is a good thing. Everyone stepping up, doing what God calls them to do, and the result is the gospel. The word of God continues to spread because 
Because these men stepped up to serve, the word of God could continue. And what's going to happen next? The, the number of disciples in Jerusalem can, continues to grow. This is the biggest mega church of ever, I think. It was like thousands and thousands of people. It grows rapidly, and a great number of priests become obedient to the faith. You know why that's impressive? Because these priests are, these are Jewish priests. They are rooted in the Old Testament law. They're just like these other religious, Jewish religious leaders. They're dead set against the apostles and against the teaching of the Messiah. This is sort of their, this is what they grew up in. They're entrenched in this. They're rooted in the Old Testament. And so this old priesthood, to see even these priests, a number of them coming to faith, we know that God is powerfully working there, right? Is that not the work of the Holy Spirit? And I believe the key thing here is that the word of God continues, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the health of the church flourishes. Why? Because the church stepped up, according to their gifts and calling, to selflessly serve so that the mission of God can continue. And the word of God spreads. So instead of hindering the, the work of God by not serving, we want to step up and selflessly serve because it fuels God's mission. This is the blueprint right here for a healthy church. A church devoted to the prayer and the word of God and everyone selflessly stepping up to serve and meet legitimate needs. And we're all, we're going to thrive if that's the case. Okay. What does that mean for us today? What's the big takeaway? Step up and selflessly serve so that the mission of God continues. Peter reminds us that we all have gifts, we all have talents and abilities God has given us so that we may serve. And if we just sit back and if we don't give it all for him, why would we expect the kingdom of God to advance? But he says this, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, each of you should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve one another. First Peter 14. So I just want to close with this to get you thinking. Are you being a good steward of God's grace in your life? Of the time, the gifts, and the talents, the abilities he's given you? Are you stepping up to serve the church so that the word of God may continue to spread? I want to thrive as a church. I want us to mature disciples. But my heartfelt prayer is that God would, would use us to reach even more. So are you ready? Are you ready for that? Are, are you, you must be willing, though, to put your yes on the table and step up and serve so that the kingdom of God may advance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, what a challenging text we have before us, but also something beautiful and amazing that happens. The word of God continues. Disciples are being made and... This, this church is just growing so fast. The apostles can't do it all. They can't handle it all, and rightly so. You have plans and purposes for each and every person in the church to step up and to serve the gifts and talents you've given them so that the word of God may continue to spread, that more and more disciples will be made. And as, as we recall from early, earlier, so the very last person from whatever tribe, tongue, or language that would be would come to faith in you, and then you will come back. You will put an end and you'll right every wrong, you'll make all things new. God, I just pray for our future. I pray for our churches. I pray for unity, that we would be about the mission of God, that we would step up and serve and lay our lives down and just give back to you what you've already given us. That we would have the privilege of joining in the work that you are doing. Use us, O oh Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay.